Good morning, and welcome to our morning service here at Polk Run Church. Uh, before I forget it, I have, as I always have to be reminded, this is Mother's Day, so happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Uh, I'd like to turn now to announcements in the bulletin. Uh, beginning on page two, note that next week after our service, we are going to have a strawberry social put on by the deacons and we thank them for that. Also on page two, a heartfelt thanks from Laurie Martin and family for the outpouring of kindness from the Polk Run family. Your prayers, cards, text, and words of encouragement and comfort mean more than you will ever know. And then at the top of page eight on this Thursday afternoon, we'll have practice of prayer. We are, I think the best way to say it is beginning to learn to be silent before God and listen for what God is saying to us before we begin our request of God. Both, both sides of this are important, the listening and the turning to God. Then on the top of page nine, Pine Springs Camp, uh, a note that the Christian Ed Committee is most grateful to Mission and Stewardship for financial support. In this partnership, Polk Run is able to sponsor nine campers for summer camp this year. So this is a good thing for us. There are further details here if you would like to know or need further information, you can call Laurie. Pirate game is out there in the future on the 19th. They may have won a game by then. Actually, they won last night. <clears throat> that, 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 that was a bit of a different game, but uh, yeah, they, they, they did win. So uh, not sure what's going on there. Uh, Also, uh, second item on page 11, uh, Graduate Sunday is on May 26th. If you know of any graduates, let us know in the office, please. Then on the back page, uh, uh, one announcement that uh, I got by phone yesterday is that this is uh, Heidi and Ron's anniversary tomorrow, so Happy anniversary to them. I think there's a couple other ones around this week. Jim and Linda? Last week. Last week? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. I guess May is a popular month for uh, anniversaries and marriages. Oh. And then tonight at 7, we have Bible study here at the church. There's a ladies' Bible study on Tuesday, and session meets Tuesday evening at 7. Again, Thursday at 2, the practice of prayer, and Circle 2 meets 7 o'clock Thursday. Heidi is the hostess, and Cindy McQuaid is the leader. Everyone is welcome. And now, if you would please turn to page 3, to the call to worship. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing and give praise to God's name. Let us worship God as we hear these sentences from Scripture. Jesus prayed, I pray that they may be one as we are one. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Gracious God, we come to you this morning knowing that you are with us. We come to you this morning 
asking for the peace that you give in the times of our lives when we cannot see peace. We ask, O oh Lord, that you be with us as we worship. We ask that we feel your presence. We ask that through your Holy Spirit you so fill us that we truly hear what you are saying. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. And now if you would stand, if you are able and comfortable, and please sing together 293, 293. We come to God, we come to this service, we come together as one, one people, having together one life in Christ. We come from a world that challenges much of what we believe. We come from a world in which often we find that what the world believes is closer to what we believe than we would like. We find that often we are influenced by advertisements, by friends, by the general state of things. We find sometimes that we move away from God. We find that our lives take directions that are not only not healthy emotionally, but not healthy for us spiritually and not healthy for us in our faith lives. These are the realities of living in this world. These are the realities that surround us, the temptations, the internal drives, the confusion that we all feel. And I think one of the things that we absolutely have to do, and I know that I have to do this, is to sit down and be very honest about this. That there are a lot of things out there that tempt me. There are a lot of times when I do the wrong thing. There are a lot of times when I just, I don't know, I just do. And I, and I think we have to be very honest about this. Because until we're honest about this, we cannot then come to God and say, this is who I am. But I also know that you are changing me into something new. And so I want to drop these things that, <clears throat> excuse me, drive me away from you so that I can draw closer to you. This is a kind of confession that lets us be real and open and then let's God change us, so to speak. So let's go to God in silence and take some time with this raw honesty 
so that we realize that God in Christ can and will change us. Let's do this in silence. And now together, let's turn to the prayer of confession here on page four. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from death to life and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have gone along with the ways of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from sin, that we may be your faithful people, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the world in his head of the church and body. There's one thing that we know, and that is that God is merciful and compassionate. We know that God has given God's self in Jesus Christ for the sins of the world and for ours. Knowing this, know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Be seated. Now let us pray. Great and wonderful God, here we are in this universe of wonder. Here we are gathered before you, waiting to hear you speak, waiting for your word, your life, your spirit to come to us and fill us so that we might know your wonder and your glory and the hope of eternal life which you give us. We ask that we truly hear this day all that you have to say for us and to us through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we have Readings from Jeremiah, the Psalms, and Matthew. So please listen as Connor reads. Good morning and happy Mother's Day. Beginning with a reading from the Old Testament, Prophet Jeremiah, chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. Listen for the word of God. Hear the word that the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and worked with an ax by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so that it cannot move. Their idols are like the scarecrows in the cucumber field, and they cannot speak. They have to be carried, for they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither is it in them to do good. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and, you, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, 
O king of the nations, for this is your due. For among all the wise ones of the nations, and in all their kingdoms there is none like you. They are both stupid and foolish. The instruction of, the instruction of idols is but wood. Beaten silver is brought from Tarkish, and gold from Uphaz. They are the work of the craftsmen and of the hands of the goldsmith. Their clothing is violet and purple. They are all the work of skilled men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth quakes, and in the nations cannot endure his indignation. Thus shall you say to them, the gods who did not make up the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. Please join me reading responsibly from Psalm 108 as printed in your bulletin. My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make melody with all my being. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praise to you among the nations. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. God has promised in his holiness. With exaltation I will divide up Shechem and portions out of the valley of Sukkoth. Moab is my wash basin. Upon Edom I cast my shoe. Over Philistia I shout my triumph. Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go out, O God, with your, our armies. With God we shall do valiantly. It is he who has tread down our foes. A reading from the New Testament book, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 26 through 33. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Here ends the readings. Thanks be to God. Why is the Bible so hard for us to read? Uh, this is, I guess you could call it a common complaint or a common statement I hear all the time. I tried to read it and I don't understand a thing. Um, it's not that the writing itself is all that complex. I took this passage from Jeremiah and ran it through uh, grammar analysis, and it comes out to be written at an eighth grade level. So most of us should be able to read it and understand it. Uh, they also give you a reading ease, and it claim is it's easy to read. So there must be something going on that is more than that, more than simply technique. 
And I will grant you that there are many odd names, Hittites, Jebusites, and so on, and so on, and so on. And anyone who's had to be a lector on Pentecost knows that there is a long list of nations, all of which are basically unpronounceable by modern Americans, if we even know that we're, we can say them right. And it is true that there are many curious customs, uh, many laws that are odd to us. I, I will grant you all that. And I think there's something more, though. I, I think it's... The, the way it's written seems to us Americans as somewhat of a jumbled mess. Yeah, think about this. There's creation... And the next thing you know, we have gods coming down from the heavens and marrying the daughters of earth. We always skip that when we go through the lectionary. Uh, next thing you know, there's a flood. Next thing you know, somebody you never heard of before Abraham is being called. And it just seems to go on and on and on and on like that. And it's, I think it's hard for us to draw connections. Oh. There doesn't seem to be a visible plot. And there are hundreds of characters that we somehow need to connect in. But amazingly, it stays on the bestseller list and has for hundreds of years. I think, I'm not sure, but I think Mao's Little Red Book has outsold it primarily because there's more people in China than the Western world. But every year, the Bible's at the very, very top of the bestseller list. Uh, and we know that several million people in America read it every day. And it changed the world, and it still does. It's changing South America, it's, it's changing Africa. The, the prediction is that I think by 2030, there will be 360 million new Christians in sub-Saharan Africa. That's more than there are people here in America. So, what's going on here? Part of the reason I think we have trouble is that we in the West have inherited from the Greeks a very linear way of thinking. A happens, and then B happens, and then C happens. I think it's also because we're used to reading instructions. First you put tab A into slot B, and then you... And we have very precise ways that we tend to want to do things. We're used to following recipes. Okay? You put your ingredients in in a certain order, or you have a catastrophe, and you have to go to Panera and eat lunch. <laughs> See, I learned about cooking that way. Uh, measuring helps, order helps. But, but we're, we're used to a very ordered way of thinking. And we live in a very technological society, whether we realize it or not. And even, Karen gets on me all the time for this, is once a movie or a episode starts, you can generally tell where it's going. Granted, the writers will once in a while throw a loop in there, but for the most part, you know exactly how they're going to play out every time. And so we're, we're very, very used to this kind of structure. And then we come to, the, come to the Bible, and we find the Bible doesn't work that way. And we give up very quickly. Oh. Now, the Bible is full of stories, all kinds of stories. And they work more like the way putting a puzzle together works. They're more like interlocking pieces. So that you get this story, and you get this story, and this story, and pretty soon you start to see a picture forming. And then you can build more and more and more until you get a more and more complete picture of what's happening. This is more the way it works. And these stories do have a kind of a plot in that they are stories of 
God and how God works primarily with Israel and then through Jesus. So that's what I want to try to do today is take a story and show how it works in different places that you might not have suspected. I'm going to start with David and Goliath. I think everybody knows David and Goliath. Goliath is this huge, giant, probably well over seven feet, maybe eight. It's said he has a spear that's all about like that. Uh, He's a trained warrior. He's fought from his youth. Uh, If you remember Dune, there's comments in Dune about how that works. A warrior trained from his youth will always win over an untrained person. Uh, Goliath comes out and insults Israel time and time and time again. Is there no one in Israel who will come out and fight? And so finally, Goliath, David, David says, well, I'll take him on. And they dress David up in armor, and David says, no, that's not going to work. He says, I can't even walk in this stuff. So David gets a sling. That's a little pouch with strings of leather. You can swing it. Anybody ever try to use one of them? It's harder than throwing softball underhand. I mean, stones go everywhere. Um, I, you know, I read the story when I was a kid, so I made a sling, and I tried to use it. <laughs> Didn't have much luck. Anyway. The picture being drawn is this powerful trained warrior against a very young, 12 or 14, very small, inexperienced youth. And so here the battle forms up. We know who's going to win, right? I'm going to read this part of the story from Scripture. David and Goliath have faced off and David says, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. It's not about power and might. It's about the fact that David comes to Goliath in the name of the Lord of the armies of Israel. And he goes on and he says what he's going to do with Goliath. He, He's going to strike him down, cut off his head, give his dead bodies to the host of the Philistines, to the birds of the air. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. See, the story is a theological story. It's it's not a story about the battle. It's a story about the God of Israel versus the Philistines. It's a very different story already. And he goes on to say, David goes on to say, the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. So what we have is a young boy, trained warrior, and the young boy comes to him in the name of the God of Israel and wins the battle. Okay. And this tells us a great deal about how God works and how God protects God's people. Israel is a tiny nation. You could fit five Israels into the state of Kentucky. Okay? It's tiny. Um, So here is Israel, surrounded by, i got to get it from your perspective, Egypt, Israel, what's now Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Babylon, Assyria, they are just absolutely surrounded by this. They are, in many senses, David. And they are surrounded by Goliath. Okay? This expands the story out into history. And it is only by God's power that Israel can exist. It is not by their military might. 
but by the power of God that they exist. And that's true to this day. Israel is still a tiny nation surrounded by countries that would destroy them in a heartbeat if they thought they could. So the story is true then and the story is true now. So I want to step now into the time of Jeremiah because Jeremiah is a time when Israel is truly threatened by all the military forces around it and sadly due to Israel's stepping away from God they do lose this battle but right here Jeremiah is trying to tell them something it's so obvious that they're headed for destruction and Jeremiah the prophet called to try to call them back to God says hear the word that the Lord speaks and he gives them two warnings he gives them one against astrology the surrounding people believed that the stars, the sun, the moon were gods. Israel should know that they are simply signs that God put in the sky to tell you of days and years and months and so on. Uh, I find it amazing that people still believe in horoscopes, but they do. So this hasn't gone away either. Uh, but the second warning, I think, is the more important for them and for us. He warns them against idols. Idols of wood and stone cannot protect you. Regardless of whether or not the nations around you believe this, the truth is that they are wood, they are stone, they are made by humans, and they are of no value. The challenge then, and I think the challenge now, is not atheism. The challenge is idols or idolatry. About 4% of Americans are self-professed atheists and another 4% are self-professed agnostics. So that leaves 92% of us who would claim that we believe in God in some way. And I'm not sure that many atheists and agnostics don't believe in something greater, but that's another whole story. It's idolatry in all its forms that causes our problems. That is, making false gods. Now, I don't think our challenge today is making false gods of wood or stone or marble or gold or silver. Although some things come pretty close, like golf clubs and fly rods and cars and we tend to idolize some things. But I don't, I don't think that's a real problem. Uh, I think our, our challenges are more sophisticated than that. Uh, we have conceptions of God of God is a big Santa Claus. God is the one who will do what I ask God to do. God is the one who will give me presents. That's a pretty popular misconception, and then people get upset when God doesn't do what they want, and then they no longer believe in God. Uh, it's kind of a downward spiral. Um, I, I think, though, even beyond that, one of our biggest challenges is not giving God priority. It amazes me how many people I have seen take vows to God and never fulfill one of them. Because, well, you know. There's this and there's that and there's other things that are far more important than anything that God could require me to do. I think this is one of our biggest idolatries in the country, that we put greater value on what is created than we put on God. In other words, we do not make God a priority in our life and we do not make God our first love. There's too many other important things out there, right? And Jeremiah is so clear that these idols must be secondary at best. They can do nothing for us. So, for Israel, a tiny nation under siege, the important thing 
is to understand that God is the Lord and it is God who will save them from their enemies. Just as for David and Goliath, it had to be that God would save David. The story continues. One story so far. Two scenarios, one story. Right at the end of the reading of Jeremiah is a line that says that we are to remember that the Lord is the true God and at his wrath the earth quakes. I'm going to draw in another image here and that is that God's wrath is at sin. Okay? Too often I think we take the concept that God is angry at a particular person, a particular race, a particular nation. But fundamentally, God's wrath is at sin, the sin that causes the disbelief, the sin that causes the wrong actions. And so this brings us 600 years into the future, into the future of Jeremiah, where we start to get a new picture of God. And in this picture, a man hangs on a cross He is beaten and whipped and barely alive. And with his last breath, he voluntarily gives up his spirit and then is buried. And when he gives up his breath, behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook. The image carries forward from Jeremiah to the time of Jesus' death. God is the one who shakes the earth. When Jesus dies, the earth shakes and the rocks were split. And no one would have believed that this was God. No no one would have looked at that cross and said, this is God. They might have said this is some poor wretch. This might have said this is a Roman criminal. They might have said a lot of things. But nobody would have looked at Jesus and said this is God. But the earth shook. And that ties us into all these other great images of God. God works in the oddest of ways and not in the ways that we would suspect. No one would have guessed that David would slay Goliath. Nobody would have bet on him. Nobody would think that the tiny nation of Israel would still be in existence. All those other great nations are gone. All of them. Nobody, nobody would have guessed that this tiny little Jew from... It was only about 10 years ago that we even discovered that where Nazareth was. I mean, he, he's that obscure. Nobody would have guessed that. But when he died... The earth shook. This is God at work. The battle is won by the weakest of persons. Jesus did not even resist. He could have called legions of angels, but he didn't. And the battle he won was not truly against the temple or the Roman Empire. The battle he won was over the two most powerful forces out out there, and that was over sin and death. He won that battle. He won the most significant battle of the time. So I hope we can see how, in a sense, one story echoes through the Bible. 
And that God is, that is that God works often through weakness. And God works in places that we don't expect. And God works through human beings that are often beaten and bloody and battered. It's this David against Goliath. Israel amongst the nations. God at his very, very weakest is the most powerful of all. That we see the power of God in the weakness of Christ so that we can be strong in our faith. Let's pray. Holy God, you have given us your word so that we may know you as you are. Too often we provide for ourselves false gods of straw and paper that do nothing. We thank you for continuing to reveal yourself to us, often through a still, small voice. Give us grace to listen and to understand that we may live in your eternal will. Amen. Now again, if you are comfortable and able, please stand and we will sing together hymn 467, How Great Thou Art.
now let us repeat our or confess our faith together as we repeat the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And now let us pray. Holy God, we know that you have created us. We know that out of the overflow of your great love, you have placed us on this earth. We also know that we are created for you. And we also know that until we know you, we will not be satisfied with the lives we are living. Oh God, help us to see that in your creation, we are giving a place and a station from which to live. And that you have blessed us with all that is good. You have given us all that we need, not only for life on this planet, but for life eternal in Jesus Christ. Strengthen us, O oh Lord, so that we do not stray from the pathways that you place before us. Strengthen us so that we do not make idols. Strengthen us so that we make you the one true God, our one true love. And that all that we do is not only for you, but by you. Give us hope, O oh Lord, in eternal life as you guide us through this life. We would pray, O oh Lord, that we come to you with thanksgiving for all of these great gifts you have given to us. And we thank you for this life. And now, Lord, we pray for your world, for that part of your world which does not know you and perhaps cannot yet know you, that we go to them as your witnesses, as your people, that they might see that through your weakness there is strength and that this strength is against sin and death so that we can all live in peace. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. And now, we would ask that the ushers come forward, please.
Now please turn to him 281, 281. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Now go in love, to love and serve the Lord in Christ.